Hello friends, thank you for watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel. As always, we're excited that you are joining us because we wouldn't really have a Sabbath School panel if it wasn't for you. And so you give us a reason to come together like this and to study the Word of the Lord, and we certainly enjoy it. Yes. And uh, we're learning a lot, and we hope that you are too. Uh, this week, we are studying lesson number nine, Living Wisely. My name is Ryan Day, and I would like to also take the opportunity to introduce the rest of the panel at this time. To my direct left, Miss Shelley Quinn, how are you? Oh, I'm blessed to be here and we just thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you. I have Tuesdays walking as children of light. All right, all right. And blessed next to you, my brother, Jason Bradley. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm excited and uh, we're going to learn why it's important that we wake up. It's oh. time to wake up. So, right. yeah, we'll cover that in a little all bit. All right, okay. And to your left, we have Pastor John Denzi. It's a blessing to be here, and it's a strange title for Wednesday, Snapping Up the Bargains. All right, <laughs> nice. And then, of course, last but not least, Miss Jill Morcone. Thank you, Ryan. On Thursday, we look at spirit-filled worship. Amen, amen. We have lots to cover, and this week's uh, not going to disappoint at all like the previous weeks because this book is just so rich and, and full of wisdom and knowledge, and, and it reminds us of the love of God. And so before we dive into lesson number nine, let us have a prayer, and I'm going to ask Pastor John Denzi if you don't mind to pray for us. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your kindness and mercy to us, and we thank you for the book of Ephesians. Yes. that as we read it, we understand that it is a message for us today. We ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will use us and that you will use us in such a way that your children will be blessed all around the world. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures and we praise you that today we can proclaim it through Three Angels Broadcasting Network. Mm -hmm. We ask for these blessings in the holy and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. amen, amen. Thank you so much. The lesson has us diving right into our memory text, which has us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. And I'm actually going to read from the New King James Version. This is Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, and it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as a fool, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So the title of this week's lesson, Living Wisely. Do not be unwise, but learn to live wisely, of course, by the power and the leading, guiding power of the Holy Spirit. I love this opening story. It just really sets the tone for this week's lesson. It says, not long ago, a crystal jug was placed on auction in the United Kingdom. The auctioneers described it as a 19th century French claret jug estimated its worth, of course at this time they had estimated its worth at 200 US dollars, okay? Two prospective bidders recognized the jug as an extremely rare Islamic ewer. Uh, its true appraisal was worth 5 million euros, which, was a, which <laughs> comes out to about 6.5 million US dollars. What allowed the bidder to walk away with such a bargain? The bidder knew something that the auctioneer did not the true value of the jug. And of course it goes on to say in Ephesians 5 verses 1 through 20, uh, Paul contrasts what pagans and believers valued. Pagans value a racy story, a drunken party, a debauched sex as the greatest treasure of life. Believers, though known an ultimate day of appraisal is coming when the true value of all things will become apparent. Instead of placing their bid on partying and drunkenness, they treasure among other things all that is good and right and true, according to Ephesians 5, 9. Of course, all that is good, right, and true in Christ. Paul thus urges them to snap up the bargains 
all right, <laughs> found in Christ as they live, as we all do on the threshold of eternity. So this is going to be an exciting lesson. Of course, this sets us up for Sunday's lesson, which is entitled, Instead, Let There Be Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, the lesson begins with telling us and, and, and reminding us of how we need to be imitators of God. But in what way do we need to be imitators of God? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 gives us some clear insight in that. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 and read verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children mm -hmm. and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. And so Paul urges the believers in Ephesus, of course, to walk in love, a call, uh, a call important to this section. Of course, we just read uh, Ephesians, but also you see this come back up in Ephesians chapter five, verse eight and 15. And of course, this walking in love is to be modeled after Christ's own love for us. I mean, that's the foundation of the gospel, right? Expressed in his atoning sacrifice. Paul affirms four things about the sacrifice. And this is what the lesson brings out. Four things about that sacrifice. Number one, it is motivated by both the love of God and the Father, or the love of God the Father and of Christ himself. So the motivation is the love. Uh, and number two, it says it is substitutionary with Christ dying in our place. Christ is no passive victim, but gave himself up for us. Mm -hmm. The third point here, under the imagery of the Old Testament sanctuary service, Christ's death is also a sacrifice which is made to God. And then, of course, the fourth point here, the sacrifice is accepted by God since it is a fragrant offering. And there's some references here to Ephesians 5, 2, Exodus 29, 18, Leviticus 2, and Philippians chapter 4 and verse 18. And of course, the lesson continues on as we read through Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 7. Notice what the Bible says here, because again, we're talking about being imitators of God, learning how to live uh, wisely under the counsel and under the leadership of God's Spirit. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7, it gives us some clear counsel here. It says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, uh, covetousness is uh, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. I love that. This is where that thanks, you know, rather just, just you know, be thankful for everything, giving thanks. For, for, this, uh, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. These are some strong words, but vital points to be made. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And I, it was interesting to see that uh, you know Sunday's lesson took quite a bit of time discussing uh, this particular section of, again, being imitators of God, knowing what not to do in order to be imitators of God, following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And it goes on to say here, in the lesson that Ephesians chapter 5 verses 3 through 5 which we just read uh, then introduces a section expressing concern for sexual ethics. The young converts of Ephesus are in danger of reversing their Christian calling and being drawn back into sexual behavior that would negate their Christian witness. This is a very serious thing and Paul deals with this not just in the book of Ephesians. He deals with this in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 21. I mean, you could see this theme come back up many, many times where even within the church, there seems to be brethren and sisters who are caught up by these sexual immoral sins that Paul takes time to address. In fact, they're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, and we're going to read not all of this section, but starting in verse 1, it says here, and listen to the words of Paul as he addresses this, my friends, and I think so while these things are sometimes not easy to talk about and not easy to discuss, these are things that yet the Holy Spirit inspired his Bible writers to bring to our attention. It says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, ver beginning with verse 1, it says, uh, it is actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. That, and of course, in this particular instance, giving a, a, an example, he says that a man has his father's wife. Uh, are you puffed? He says, and are you puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you? For I indeed 
as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has done this deed. So Paul's saying, look, I've considered the matter. I've thought this through, and here's my point on it. He continues in verse 4. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 6, your glorying is not not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. The point that Paul's making here is saying, you know what? You're compromising. You're letting some of these things come in from and among you. And if you don't address this in the right kind of way, if you don't deal with this in the way that God is counseling you to do so, then you're allowing this little bit of leaven in. And that leaven process, of course, will cause things to grow and to swell into something that it should not. And in of course, he goes on in verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. I mean, these are strong words, right? We know that Christ dwelt with sinners, but we're talking about brothers and sisters in the church who know better, and yet they're practicing maybe this habitually. They're allowing this into their life, and we are to deal with it accordingly, according to what Paul says here in verse 9. And in verse 10, he says, yet I certainly did not mean with sexually immoral people of this world. He says, you know the world's doing that. You know the Gentiles are practicing these things. He says, or with the covetous or the extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. He says, you're going to have to live in the world. You're going to have to go out into the world. But verse 11, he says, now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or extortioners, nor even to eat with such a person. And so I think the point that Paul's making here is obviously sexually immoral sins are like no other type. They're, they're, they are like any other type of sin in the sense he lists there, you know, idolaters and revilers and drunkards, extortioners. When we allow this to come in and we turn a blind eye to it and we say, oh, you know, uh, you, know it, you know, God will deal with it or God will deal with it in his own way. You know, sometimes we allow that leavening compromising process to come in and it affects the flock. It affects the brethren. We have to deal with it respectfully. We have to deal with it accordingly, according to Paul's counsel here. And and sometimes those are the hard things that we must do. I think the message that we need to take away that what this particular passage is addressing in these opening verses of Ephesians chapter 5 is that, you know what, to be imitators of God sometimes means to deal with, with tough issues. Mm -hmm. Sometimes means to have to stare adversity in the face and say, you know what, uh, while we have to deal with these things respectfully and with, and with love, we also have to be true to who we are and be true to the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ. And that's why I love, uh, in accordance with this, the passage that kept coming to my mind as I was studying this was 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, because the church mm -hmm. is supposed to be a positively affecting the world, but rather sometimes the world, mm -hmm. as we allow that leavening process and that compromising process to occur, it ends up causing more damage to the church than you think. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 17, it says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. Yes, my friends, we are to be imitators of God, uh, not in and of our own power, obviously. This whole book of Ephesians, as we have studied so far and are going to continue to study, is all about surrendering our will to the power that gives us the strength to be imitators of God. And of course, we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That was wonderful foundation. Thank you, Brian. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Monday's lesson, Walking as Children of Light. What does Paul mean by the term light? Light is the reflection of God's character. Light is his moral perfection, his righteousness. God cannot sin. What is darkness? The absence of light, the absence of God's truth, the absence of God's righteousness is darkness. So Paul is about, he's contrasting two lifestyles. Those who are Christians, who've accepted Christ, who are filled with the power of God, have been conveyed, they've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's light. And what in sharp contrast, he's talking about those who are ruled by law, lies, by the controlling power of Satan, those who live in darkness, 
are spiritually dead. They have unconverted characters. They're not allowing Christ and the Word and the Spirit to change them. So they're void of God's truth. Now, I love how Paul began, and I want to begin in Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. He said, you be made alive, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Oh, I was there. He said, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He's talking about Satan and his demonic spirits. And he says, the spirit who now works in what? The sons of disobedience. Mm -hmm. See, God's children, when we walk as his children, we're reflecting his character and we will walk motivated by love to obey the Lord. So we've looked at, you just went through this, li this list of the deeds of darkness in mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 4 and 5, filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, um, fornication, unclean, anything that's unclean means it's not acceptable to God. Mm -hmm. That's what unclean means. Covetousness, idolatry. Here's the bottom line. God does not tolerate habitual immorality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God does not tolerate habitual impurity. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. That is the essence of his being. 1 John 1, 5 says that God is light. That there's no darkness in him. He's righteous. He's holy. So what Paul's wanting us to do, the Bible says God never changes. He wants us to understand that we're to become like our father. We're depending upon him. So Ephesians 5, 6, Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words, but because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Vain words, empty words, they're misleading. They're words that excuse weakness mm -hmm. and words that excuse sin. Mm -hmm. They're words that oppose God's commandments. I think of Genesis 3, 4. Oh, you shall not surely die. Mm -hmm. Those are vain words and false teachers have infiltrated the church and they have said, oh, God's grace is a license to sin. Those are vain and empty words. They are unbiblical. They don't line up with God's word at all. Let me tell you something. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Christ didn't die for us so that we could live like the devil. Mm. So children of disobedience throw off all moral restraint. They abandon God's ways of doing things righteously. And I'm going to tell you something else. They are willfully ignorant mm -hmm. of his word. Mm -hmm. They will not study the word of God because mm -hmm. they don't want to know right. what mm -hmm. God's will is. And the wrath of God, what is the wrath of God? This is his justice. This is his righteous judgment against sin and the pain it causes. And he is going to put an end to sin. There will come that strange day when the long suffering God has said, that's it, no more. There's no one else that's going to accept me. And he will visit justice on sin and sinners. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. You have to earn your death. You earn it by walking in darkness. Mm. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Mm. So Paul says in Ephesians 5, 7, you see the contrast. Do not be partakers with the sons of disobedience. This is a strong warning mm. not to fall back into those same kind of sins that God brought them out of. Sin brings shame and separation from God. And listen to 1 John 3, 8 through 10. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. What? That he might destroy, destroy the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. 
In this, the children of God, there's children of God, and the children of the devil are made manifest. Whoo! Are you a child of the mm -hmm. devil? Mm -hmm. He says, whoever does not practice righteousness, God's way of doing things, mm -hmm. is not of God. See, the goal of righteousness by faith is God wants to restore righteousness in his people because when we live according to God's will, then we know that our life will be happier and we have eternal life. Ephesians 5, 8, Paul goes on. You were once darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children of the light. Walk in the truth of a righteous God. You know, Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, mm -hmm. but will have the light of life. Jesus delivers us from the darkness. Once we were unbelievers. I mean, you might be in the church and be an unbeliever in the righteousness mm -hmm. of God. Going to church doesn't make you saved. It's accepting Christ, being filled with his Holy Spirit. He says, once we walked in darkness, but now we're in union with the light of the world. And notice this. He didn't just say, walk in the light. He said, walk as yes. children of light. So the light of Christ, the light of his word, the light of the spirit now possesses us and we are to radiate that light. We are to follow in the footsteps of Christ's righteousness. Amen. Ephesians 5, 9, he says, the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Hey, we need the light of Christ in us, the sunshine mm -hmm. to produce this fruit. Let's look at this. Goodness is moral excellence in word and in deed. The fruit of the Spirit is moral excellence. It is also righteousness, which is doing things in God's right way and being obedient obedient, motivated by love, that we will have integrity, not only before God, but integrity before man. Truth, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. Truth is God's reality, His honesty, His sincerity. So as Christians, we are to reflect this fruit of the Spirit and not participate in shameful mm. practices of the darkness of Satan. Grace includes to me the three greatest gifts of grace, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, and the Word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at those gifts of grace. You understand the effects of grace. Grace empowers us to obey. You can only obey by grace. Right. And 1 John 2.29 says, if you know that he, Jesus, is righteous. You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So Paul concludes in Ephesians 5, 10 saying, find out what is acceptable to the Lord. How do we find that out? We've got to search the scriptures. We've got to take his advice of Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, mm -hmm. but let your mind be renewed by the word of God that you can find what is his perfect and acceptable will. That's how you walk as children of light. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelly, for that. And my friends, don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. 
Hello, friends. Welcome back to the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to our brother Jason Bradley for Tuesday's lesson. All right. I have Tuesday's lesson and it's entitled Awake, O Sleeper. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, Eduarda Obera had survived 15,663 days or about 42 years in a coma. Obera suffered a childhood history of diabetes. And in December of 1969, she contracted pneumonia and the combination of the two illnesses proved to be too much for her body to handle at the tender age of 16. And she slipped into a diabetic coma mm. on January 3rd, 1970. Eduarda held on strong through her 59th birthday in April of 2012, but unfortunately passed away later that year. Wow. Now, Unlike Eduarda's case, a woman by the name of Annie Shapiro was in a coma for 29 years due to a massive stroke and suddenly awakened in 1992. So what's the purpose of me sharing these two stories with you today? Some of us are in a spiritual coma and we need mm -hmm. to wake up before it's too late. Mm -hmm. Paul gave two powerful exhortations in Ephesians 5 verses 11 through 14. Number one, live a God honoring lifestyle as children of light. And number two, don't live a sexually immoral a God opposing lifestyle exhibiting the unfruitful works of darkness. Mm -hmm. And so let's read Ephesians chapter 5 verses 11 through 14 and see what Paul is saying here. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Okay, so let's break that down. What does it mean to live a God honoring lifestyle as children of light? Well, we know that we need to walk in love. Ephesians chapter five, verses one and two says, therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. We need to exude the fruit of the spirit. Ephesians chapter five verses nine and 10 says, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now this might sound pretty basic, but we need to learn to behave how? Like a Christian. Yes. So for more on that, you can check out Romans chapter 12, verses nine through 21. We won't have the time to cover all of those verses, but when you get a chance, check that out. Romans chapter 12, verses nine through 21. We also need to be a living sacrifice to God. Romans chapter 12, verses one and two mm -hmm. says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now let's transition into the second exhortation that Paul gave uh, where he stated, we are instructed not to live a sexually immoral, God opposing lifestyle, exhibiting the unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians chapter five, verse, verses three and four. Let's look at that. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now we'll go to Proverbs chapter five, verses 20 through 23. And stay with me because you'll, you'll see the connection in just a moment here. Uh, For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths, his own iniquities and trap the wicked man and he is caught in the cords of his sin. 
he shall die for lack of instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Mm -hmm. Now you pair that with this powerful quote from the book of education, page 291. It says this, we should be aware of treating sin as a light thing. Mm -hmm. Terrible is its power over the wrongdoer. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. The greatest wrong done to a child or youth is to allow him to become fastened in the bondage of evil habit. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, is powerful. We're seeing that in today's society. We're seeing where parents are allowing their kids to have these gender reassignment surgeries and so many other things, and they're being fastened into evil, evil habits. Mm -hmm. And, and God is saying we can't have that. And so in Ephesians chapter five, verse 11 and verse 13, we'll look at that now and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Verse 13, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light for whatever makes manifest is light. Now let's spend a little bit of time here because I know some of you are probably thinking, I can't wait to expose the darkness and tell, tell Susan about what Philip did and yada, yada, yada. But let's take a minute to pause for the cause. Matthew chapter seven, verses three through five says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, Amen. but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Make sure you take heed to Matthew 18 and, and implement that when there's a disagreement. So then what is Paul talking about in Ephesians chapter five, verses 11 through 13, where he says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light for whatever makes manifest is light. Here it is. Just like the moon reflects the light of the sun, mm. we as, as Christians, we should reflect the light of the sun, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. to the world. In other words, we can expose darkness by behaving like a Christian, by exuding the fruit of the spirit, and by being the change we want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know doing the right thing isn't always easy, but it's, mm -hmm. it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Where do we get the strength? That's the next logical question. Where do we get the strength to do the right thing? The answer can be found in Philippians chapter four, verse 13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God can give us the victory. If you're struggling with sexual immorality, God can give you yeah. the victory. If you're struggling with homosexuality, covetousness, gossiping or uncleanness, God can give you the victory. How do we know that we can gain the victory? Well, for one thing, we don't serve a problem-oriented God. We serve a solution-oriented God. Look at for 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now here's the good news. And such were right. some of you, Amen. but you were washed, mm. but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Here's the crux of the message. God is calling us to wake up, to depart from our comatose uh, state and pursue him. Rejection leads to withdrawal. Acts of the Apostles, page 266. Men cannot with impunity reject the warnings that God in mercy sends them from, from those who persist in turning from these warnings, God withdraws his spirit, leaving them to the deceptions that they love. Stop hitting the snooze button and sleeping through life. It's time to wake up and walk in the way of Christ. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. praise the Lord. Well, uh, Wednesday's uh, lesson is enti entitled Snapping Up the Bargains. My name is John Dinsey, 
And I'm going to give you right now the reason why this is called snapping up the bargains. And the uh, Dr. McVeigh, Professor McVeigh, uh, reveals that uh, actually the word redeeming, which is a verse we will read in a moment, uh, comes from the verb, uh, Greek verb, exagerazo, uh, which means it, it's like a, a phrase taken from the marketplace, uh, which means to buy and to snap up, uh, snap up the bargains. But uh, we're going to use it in a spiritual sense here in a moment. Now, uh, my portion is to talk about Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, 15 through 17. But I want to back up so we can see a little bit of the progression that we see here in the book of Ephesians. We have talked about this already. I'm going to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Mm -hmm. And it says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of of their mind. Mm -hmm. We as Christians should walk differently. Now therefore, it says here in verse 24, uh, Ephesians 4, 24, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. This is the way we are to live. Now I move to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13, giving us the context for the verses I will read. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is an invitation for you. Uh, awake from the dead, spiritually dead, and Christ will give you light. Now we move to the verses that are part of the study uh, for Wednesday. It says, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. See then, because of what we read before, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Mm -hmm. So we see here these verses. And, you know, when you look at these verses, let's, let's go back to verse 15 and talk about it. You know, uh, if, you talk, if you see somebody behaving a certain way, hey, what are you doing? I'm behaving circumspectly. We don't use that word. Yeah. So what does it mean? It means to walk uh, diligently, uh, distinctly. We as Christians should walk distinctly, yes. carefully following Jesus. Remember that Jesus says, he who wants to come after me should do what? Take up his cross daily and follow him. So this is the way we should walk. And when you say walk, does that mean? Uh, it's not talking about the physical walking. It's talking about the way we live. It's a way we live from day to day, from moment to moment, day to day. And it says, not as fools, but as wise. Well, let's talk about the fools for a moment. <laughs> let's talk about the fools because this is something that uh, the Bible brings out. And uh, in, in the Bible, you, you see the word fool used in a certain way. And I want to first go, uh, the word fool here is from a Greek word, which also means like unwise. You're behaving unwise. You're behaving as a fool. And in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 23, the Bible says, To do evil is like a sport to a fool, but a man of understanding has wisdom. To the fool, to the ones that are of the world, they are living a foolish life. To them, it's like having a, having a baseball game, like having a volleyball game. Uh, they think nothing of it. We're just enjoying ourselves, but we are to walk as Christ walked. Mm -hmm. So we see here in James chapter 1, verse 19, something for us to consider. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, mm -hmm. slow to speak, slow to wrath. You know, we are too, too quick to jump into uh, answering people and uh, right away uh, putting people down. I remember when I was younger and uh, even in the in Dominican Republic and here, uh, it seemed like if somebody called you dumb, you have to call them dumber 
and if they brought you, if they say you're 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 so low that etc., you, you probably remember some of that. Uh, you're so low that you can't. You, you you have to look up to look at the the top of the sidewalk. You know these different things and these ways of of. Uh, Putting people down becomes like an art to some people, and we need to be careful, slow to speak, swift to hear. And I now move to Proverbs 17, 28. I consider this a, a verse, I, 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 uh, this is something that uh, I took as a, as a way to live. It says, and notice, it says, Proverbs 17, 20, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace, when he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. And this is true. Sometimes we're just too fast to talk, too fast to talk. And we need to be careful and slow down with the way we express ourselves. Our words should be seasoned with grace, mm -hmm. that it, it will minister to people. It will encourage people, inspire people to do better. So. Let's say you're sitting at your porch and you have your for sale sign on your car and you see somebody walking and all of a sudden they stop and they start looking at the car and it says for sale. And you say, what would you think if you're sitting in the porch looking at this person looking at your car? They want to buy it. They're interested. They want to buy it. So what would you do? You get off the porch and you approach the person. You like it? Let me tell you something about it. And the reason I say this is because too often, even Christians are walking in the devil's territory. Mm. And he says, oh, I see that you're interested. Mm. And then he yes. brings you these temptations to entice you further because you are already interested. And I am going to read from First Selected Messages, uh, page 166. It says, Satan is busily working with all who will give him encouragement. Those who have the light but refuse to walk in it will become confused until darkness pervades their soul and shapes their whole course of action. But the spirit of wisdom and goodness of God as revealed in his word will become brighter and brighter as they follow on in the path of true obedience. All the righteous demands of God will be met through sanctification of the Holy Spirit. So yes, let us be busy about doing the Lord's work. Let us not give encouragement to the devil. Far too many of us give encouragement to the devil to uh, entice us, tempt us, and lead us down, as we said, had uh, before in another lesson, down this spiral of evil. Let us follow the Lord with all of our heart. James chapter 2, verse 11 and through 13 says, For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. And it says in verse 13, For judgment is without mercy, to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, we have to understand that we should speak and do as those that will be judged by the law of liberty. And so I encourage you to consider now, uh, I'm going to back up and read it again, Ephesians chapter 5 and reading verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. How? Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. My brothers and sisters, the days are evil. And be careful and understand that if you delay looking at evil, if you stay there, the devil's going to become interested. Oh, he is interested. She is interested. Interested. Let's make him one of ours. So be very, very careful. Stay away from those things that will do you harm because the days are evil. And you know, um, people can start looking at evil so much that it becomes so familiar to them that it becomes before they hated it, but all of a sudden they begin, well, it's, maybe it's not as bad as I thought. And this is something that you even saw in the days of Abraham. The custom was, uh, 
that, uh, oh, you can take the handmaid and you can have children. And Abraham and Sarah adopted this thing. Let us be careful. Let us walk as Jesus walked. He is inviting us to follow him with all of our hearts. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny and Jason and Shelley and Pastor Ryan. What an incredible study. To me, as we walk through the book of Ephesians, we're getting into the heart of the matter and who we really are as Christians. Not a mask of superficial Christianity, but this goes to the heart. On Thursday's lesson, we look at spirit-filled worship, and my name is Jill Morricone. Before the verses we have to look at is Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. But before we go there, I want to go to John chapter 4. This is, of course, Jesus speaking to the woman of Samaria. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. What is appropriate worship? It is a place where truth is preached, not Amen. error. It is a place where the gospel is lived, not hypocritical Christians who don't live by what we find in the Word of God. It is a place where the Holy Spirit is present. We're going to look, as we look at spirit-filled worship, I decided to contrast pagan and false worship with godly spirit-filled worship. Now, for the godly spirit-filled worship part, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, those verses, uh, 18 to 21. For the false worship, the pagan worship, we're going to Exodus chapter 32. So you can turn there. We're going to be flipping between Exodus 32 and Ephesians chapter 5. In Exodus 32, we see, of course, the golden calf experience with the children of Israel. And that is where we're basing our example of false or pagan worship. So I have five characteristics of false worship and five characteristics of spirit filled worship and we're going to contrast the two of them in these passages. So let's start with the faults. This is characteristic number one of pagan or false worship. Pagan worship is centered on self. Let's look at Exodus 32 verse 1. Pagan worship is centered on self. Exodus 32 verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered to Aaron and said to him, Come, let us make gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. They were tired of waiting, were they not? Moses has been up in the mountain a long time. Why isn't he coming down sooner? They were uncertain of the future. They decided to take matters into their own hands. They did what they wanted to do. Their worship was focused on what felt good to them and on what they wanted. It was focused on self. By contrast, flip over to Ephesians 5. By contrast, we see spirit-filled worship is centered on Jesus not self. We're in Ephesians 5, verse 19, the second half of that verse. Singing and making melody in your heart to yourselves. Is that what it says? <laughs> Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Any church or worship service that exalts doctrine above Jesus is false that exalts formality above Jesus, that exalts personalities above Jesus, that exalts performance above Jesus, that exalts pleasure above Jesus, that exalts music above Jesus, that exalts feelings above Jesus, is not godly spirit-filled worship. Let's go back to Exodus 32. We're going to look at characteristic number two of this pagan false worship. That is, pagan worship is centered on idolatry. Or in Exodus 32, verse 4, He, this is Aaron, received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now we're 40 days after the Ten Commandments, right? 40 days after Mount Sinai. And what is the beginning of Exodus chapter 20, the preamble to the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now this God, this graven image, 
He didn't bring them out of the land of Egypt. God brought them. 40 days have passed. They have already forgotten God and they have turned to idol worship. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Jump over to Ephesians chapter 5. Spirit filled worship is centered on God and others, not on idolatry. Ephesians 5 verse 21 talks about submitting to one another in the fear of God. And we already read in verse 19 how we're to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. So it is centered on the Lord and centered on other people, not centered on idolatry. An idol is not just a graven image or a calf. It's anything that we place in the place of God, mm -hmm. anything that we give our affections to or our heart to, any church or worship that exalts self or performance is not godly, mm -hmm. spirit-filled worship. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Exodus 32. We're looking at characteristic number three of pagan, spirit, uh, pagan false worship. We're in verse six. Pagan worship is centered on sensuality and feelings. Or in verse 6, Exodus 32, 6, they rose early the next day. They offered burnt offerings. They brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to, what's that word? Play. Play. Now, in Hebrew, it can mean laughed, but it also is used in Genesis 26 for Isaac caressing his wife. This is something sensual taking place. If you go down to verse 25, we're in Exodus 32, 25, and this is King James Version. It says, when Moses saw that the people were naked, now this has something to do with sensual worship, mm -hmm. false pagan worship, if you read Numbers 25, Baal of Peor, what happened? The men of Israel committed harlotry with the woman of Moab and sacrificed to their gods. Mm -hmm. So pagan false worship is centered on sensuality and feelings. Jump over to Ephesians chapter 5. Spirit-filled worship is centered on principled living, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, not based on sensuality and feelings. We see this in Ephesians 5, 18. Do not be drunk with wine and which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. This is principle living instead of by your feelings and what your heart desires. We see in Ephesians 5, 17, which Pastor Johnny read, do not be unwise or foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. And how can we understand the will of the Lord without the word of God? Amen. Godly worship needs to be centered Amen. on the Word of God yeah. and on spirit-filled living, not by how we feel. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Exodus 32. We're in character characteristic number four of pagan false worship. It is centered on Satan's music. Exodus 32, 17 and 18. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is noise of war in the camp. But he said... It's not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. Now, this is not godly singing. This is singing that Satan's music. Pagan worship is centered on Satan's music. Now, we flip over to Ephesians 5, and we discover that spirit-filled worship is centered on godly music. That music is a part and parcel of spirit-filled worship, but it's godly music. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Godly worship is centered on music. It is centered on the Lord. It draws the mind, the thoughts, the heart, the attitude to God. It is filled with the Holy Spirit. We have one more characteristic. Let's go back to Exodus 32. Characteristic number five, pagan worship is centered on doubt, discouragement, and deception. Exodus 32, one, the people said, come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Well, that wasn't the truth. God brought them up from Egypt. They were talking discouragement. Mm -hmm. They were talking doubt. By contrast, spirit-filled worship is centered on praise to God, not doubt, but praise to God. Ephesians 5, 20 
giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise and thanksgiving should characterize godly worship. So in summary, five characteristics of spirit-filled worship. Spirit-filled worship is centered on Jesus, not self. It's centered on God and others, not idolatry. It's centered on principled living, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, not sensuality. It's centered on godly music, not Satan's music. It's centered on praise to God, not discouragement and deception. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill, for wow. that. Thank you guys so much. Let's take uh, some time for some final thoughts. I just wanted to mention Ephesians 5, 9 again. If we are walking as children of the light, we will be fruitful. And the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. There is no goodness. There is no righteousness. There is no truth in the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Amen. I just want to mention that you can gain the victory. Whatever you're struggling with, you can gain the victory through Christ. Don't listen to the world because they are enablers. You can gain the victory through Christ. Go to him in prayer, study his word, and grow in his likeness. Amen. 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 There are great blessings and privileges that we can have as we take up our cross and follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we look at the church that you attend, is the church that you attend a church filled with truth? Is it filled with Jesus? Is it filled with the Holy Spirit and with Christians who desire to follow God and His Word? Mm. Amen. Thank you guys so much. You know, I'm just going back to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, which makes it very clear that we do not love the world or the things of the world. That if anyone loves the Father, the love of the Father is not in him. But all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Uh, you know, with this, this lesson has been a reflection and a reconsideration of all of those things that when we compromise, when we lay down and we allow the devil to come in and we focus our eyes and our attention and we allow that leavening process, that compromising process to occur, uh, bad things can happen. That's why we must safeguard ourselves, which we're going to be talking about how to safeguard ourselves in future lessons when we talk about the whole armor of God when we get into chapter six. But uh, my friends, you're not going to want to miss next week uh, because next week, lesson number 10, we're going to deal with the latter verses of chapter five of Ephesians, and it's entitled Husbands and Wives Together at the Cross. And that's really what we're looking forward to, right? And that's what reminds me of our closing verse here, Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We just want to thank you for joining us so much here at this 3 and Sabbath School panel. And do just that. Take the counsel of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith.